Can you just give us an overview? Although that's a, that's a, that's a mouthful, I do a recognize, mouthful, yeah. of, your, of your farm and what's going on here. So this plot where we are now was a secondary plot that we took about five years ago. It belongs to an elderly couple who are not able to maintain this amount of land anymore. So in the beginning we used to use it a lot for uh, grass and growing seed for animals. Anyway, when I took over the land, it, had, it was after having a lot of urea and pesticide use. So for the first two years, anyway, we didn't really plant anything in here. We just left it for animals to graze. Okay, transitional organic. And if. then since about three years ago, we started to turn these into raised bio-intensive beds. So on the lower land, you can see like where we have the bigger terraces and the open spaces is easier for us to maintain vegetable beds. And then up on the higher plots where it gets steeper is where we have, let's say, our, our orchards. Okay. So at every three meters up there, we have small trees growing. You can't quite see them yet. They're, they haven't quite come to size. Okay, right. But give it another year or two, there'll be quite a presence up there. Right. And then in between those spaces, we made small nurseries for uh, growing uh, rootstocks for grafting. The nursery and grafting business has really become our main business here over the last two years. Yeah. Uh, from as a market, as a marketable product and something beneficial, we've done very well with it. So now we're we're starting to become self-sufficient in growing our own rootstocks. We have the target of 10,000 trees for our own nursery every year, so we will require 10,000 rootstocks. And we're also developing as a, like a, as an income generator in the depths of winter, when like December month, like there, there isn't much income generation going on on the farm anyway, it's the dead months. So at this time, if we can sell 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 rootstocks, it would be a massive boost into our farm's income in the dry season. Who is your primary customer there? That or the, What's your target? Who, who do you want to be your primary target? What I would love to be my primary target or my primary customer is uh, farmers. Farmers who themselves want to create value-added products on their land because farming in Nepal in general is considered to be unprofitable. Uh, but that's what happens when you have like when you're mostly growing either corn or in the summer seasons or mustard in the dry seasons. These are not value-added products. Mm -hmm. People as well are moving away from the idea of working all day in fields. A lot of people have office work or college educations or trying to increase their life value in other ways than farming. But seeing as how everyone in Nepal has land, the land is going empty. I personally think that... Uh, tree cultivation kind of marries the best of both worlds because to have orchards automatically increases your respectability in your community it's like intelligent farming absolutely plus the, the market price is uh, ridiculously good in nepal for fruits like avocados are up anywhere like 500 rupees a kilo apples are anywhere up to 300 rupees a kilo uh, peaches plums uh, name it you can almost grow everything in nepal you know so, and as well, Nepal is imports vast more than it produces in a year. So we already have the market here. We don't need to look for selling to India or China. As an example, last year in Nepal, 40,000 metric tons of apple was harvested in Nepal. 60,000 metric tons was imported from India and China. And I'm pretty sure that like India and China are not sending you their first quality items. Absolutely you know, they're, not. They're, they're, they're sell, selling you what they cannot sell themselves. Right. So, especially as the genetics of apples and the knowledge of apples have grown here a lot over the years. Like in Nepal, apple was always classically a, a high region product like Manang, Mustang, uh, Joomla, Rolpa places that actually are not easy to get to market to begin with. Uh, but now we have varieties like Anna Apple, growing from 1,000 meters to 1,800. We have Dorset Goldens, growing from 800 meters to 1,800. We have Strawberry Chenangos. We have uh, Fuji Apples. So the varieties available are much better than before. And the uh, growing range 
has increased significantly. So it means like people in the middle hill elevation where we are now, like from 1,200 meters upwards, which is more than half of Nepal, like two thirds of Nepal is above that altitude, you know, can actually get in on the apple growing market. And on top of that, apples that are grown in the middle hills will come to market one to two months before apples that are grown at the higher altitudes as well. Okay. So Nepal can actually create its own supply stream over half the year, let's say. Up here you, you described earlier, if you can just let me go over again with this with you. Um, now we've got this, it's a, it's a common terrace uh, uh, slope. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got another residence at the top, your land uh, stops right about the big trees there? Yeah. Or? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we've got this water tank, if you can follow my finger. He's got a large swale to prevent flooding, which is nice, and uh, that channels water in both directions. And then we come down, and then please describe just briefly what you got on those terraces. Give us an idea of your biodiver. So, where the terraces start to get a bit deeper, we, we plant it out with fruit and nut trees. We have about 38, 39 varieties of, uh, <laughs> of fruits and nuts here. Okay. Uh, some are just planted one or two to have the, the trees as a mother stock. Okay. For, for nursery work. Right. And then in between those, we have uh, fruit stock nursery beds. And then, as you said already, above the yellow drum is uh, the roadway with a swale dug into it to stop all this. Uh, flooding in terms of the monsoon season and to help stop everything uh, washing away. Okay. And then at the top of the land as well, we've planted out uh, large uh, varieties of trees like walnuts, like a, a large growing tree. And they're to do two things, one, three things. One is to create a sense of privacy on the north side. They'll eventually grow nice and big. They won't put any shadow into the farm as such. Okay. Uh, walnut in itself is super high value and it's something that I will be able to harvest, my kids will be able to harvest and even my grandkids will be able to harvest and have an income out of. And secondary or third point is that uh, the root system on a walnut tree are very expansive and strong. So where things get steeper, they do more work for me to reinforce the whole farm so I don't need to worry about that sliding down some year on me. Okay. Uh, so yeah, and then the, the huge swale as well, which is kind of running from behind the drum for about 400 meters down through the top of the land, through the forest we have behind this house, and exiting down into the river, okay. which then also comes to our, which is our water source as well, so we keep topping up our water source as well. Right. Uh, so this brings up another another um, kind of a deep subject for farmers for farming is that long-term planning long-term mentality or uh, let's just say a long-term heart because you have to care you have to care about your progeny um, I assume that most people listening to this are planning to have kids if you don't have them already and uh, what are you going to leave them now uh, Charlie's adequately described that there's nothing to leave when we've got Western people that do nothing but rent and then he's just got little, you know, little trinkets uh, to, to pass down to the family. But what about something real, something big? If you do have land, you put black walnut in particular, that's my favorite, but walnut trees, which is some of the best wood on the planet, bar none, uh, for, for everything you can imagine. And then, uh, you have every other kind of species that, that suits your fancy or that is good enough for your growing area. For your grandkids, for your kids, you know, you're not going to see it, but you're doing it for them. Plus, what Charlie just described is you're doing so many, you're doing so many depths of, of reasoning here. This is really good multiplicity, is that uh, you put these better trees in there. Maybe they cost more for you to buy, and it's some work to put them in, but you've got the roots going in, holding that hillside so that your family does sell, have something to plant yeah. years from Security now. In Security in the end, exactly. How long have you been here now, Charlie? Uh, I've been in this village, start, started this project seven years ago. 
about four years went into uh, animals, particularly cows. Okay. Uh, but in the end, I, I stepped back from that. I handed the cow business over to another. And now I've been focusing on the nursery and the vegetable business. Two years of work is what we're looking at. And, and uh, I'm going to give you a spin on this again, folks. Uh, take a look. Um, it's a lovely stretch of land. I know most of you don't have access to this much, but uh, two years of labor, uh, which to me is just sheer heart and joy when you're down in it, when you're among it, you can feel it because it's your love, it's your labor, it's your effort, and it's your fruits. And somebody, when you, when you see the first face of somebody that you really care for, tasting into one of your fruits, and I don't care what it is, because it's going to be good. Their reaction, that's it right there. That's hook, line, and sinker, your cost, your investment, your your purchases, your toil, your effort, um, because you know that whatever they have expressed is what everyone else is going to express out there in the market, or just people that are fortunate enough to come to your house to have the greatest meal in, on, in their lifetime. And uh, now you are on straight, it's straight business visa, that's how you swing yeah. your yeah, thing yeah. here? play the game, pay the taxes. There you go. Like this, I'm here, my wife is here, my family can be here. Okay. Uh, no double entente games. Okay. And you know, if you pay your taxes, you, you have a bit of a, how to say, you have a bit of a right to shout at people afterwards. Which Sometimes it's heavily lacking, you need that behind you, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to tell people politely to F off mm -hmm. with some muscle. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. You've got some claim there, yeah. Yeah, well, because of this year, we were able to buy our first piece of land. It's in our own uh, name. Nobody can take that away from us. Uh, as the business grows, we keep having the, the means to keep adding on to what we own already. Mm -hmm. Now this year we were able to build this house as well and to create another economic stream, which is tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe even a, again another like a subclass of economic stream, which is to put this as a showpiece 